The world is changed forever by a new technology, nuclear. Two superpowers dominate the world. Each facing the other in a state of neither war nor peace. This is the story of the Cold War, how the push of one button could lead to total global destruction. Together we shall save our planet, or together we shall perish in its flames. How the struggle between two political systems caused millions to suffer. Spy was very much part of the Cold War. And how a world was created which lived in constant fear. Mad World, mutually assured destruction. In episode five, Advances in nuclear technology imperil the world again. Our two nations now have five times more missile warheads than we had just eight years ago. You know, tens, hundreds, thousands of systems, any one of which is capable of destroying the widespread peace of humanity in the blink of an eye. And the end of a war is never the end of the suffering. Nowadays, the bodies are just left there until they're mutilated by animals and the traffic as the Cold War conflict spreads to a new continent. To learn what it is like to be under fire, three quivering recruits faced a Kalashnikov rifle. Boys next door become mass murderers. I went out there basically to, <laughs> to get enough money to buy a house. And the latest nuclear weapon is an invisible killer. A devilish weapon, basically. Totally inhuman. Chile, November 1970. An election victory will lead to the violent death of the nation's leader. It begins peacefully. The Chilean people vote in a socialist coalition. The year saw a unique political development in Latin America. In September, Dr. Salvador Allende was elected president of Chile, the first Marxist head of state on the continent to achieve power by democratic means. We were so happy because Allende represents a big change in the Chilean society. Well, my position initially was uh, in charge in the south of Chile, the agricultural ministry. Allende is originally a physician. This is his fourth attempt at winning power. He doesn't waste time turning his country around. Chile was governed by the oligarchy. And all those governments, they were a puppet from the United States. And they took the natural resource from Chile with the North American Companies. Chile's great open cast mines produce the largest amount of copper in the world. The three biggest are American owned. Chile's Marxist president, Salvador Allende, nationalized American copper mines. The government also nationalized major banks and large land holdings. But worst of all for the Americans, Allende is a communist. And Chile is 6,000 kilometers south of the USA. Top secret moves are made in the United States at the highest level. Nixon said to Kissinger, you must stop the Allende government in any way. The government policies have failed. The Marxist theory does not work among a free people. No one knows at the time, but President Nixon is planning to end the rule of the communist government. Washington cuts off credit to Chile. 
the international bank, the monetary fund, they closed and, and helped with Chile. The chilling in the economy slowed, food was scarce, and when anti-government demonstrations occurred, Allende declared a state of emergency and instituted food rationing. Tension in the country builds. We didn't have a strong perception of the American influence in Chile and that time. They were talking with different members of the army to convince them the necessity of overthrow the Allende government. Then the army tries to take over. You may be able to hear it. The, the fighting is now erupted in earnest. Chaos and terror hit the streets of Santiago. UPI cameraman, television cameraman, Ricardo Correa, was filming a part of a gun battle from the 11th floor office of the United Press International. Uh, troops uh, on the street uh, saw the reflection of his camera, mistook it for a weapon, and riddled the office with rifle fire. The attempted coup fails, this time. Six weeks later, Allende is re-elected as president. But the peace does not last long. Meanwhile, striking truckers and their families camped out in fields near their idle vehicles. The army has seized most of the vehicles, but was searching for tow trucks because owner drivers had flattened tires and removed engine parts. Documents recently released reveal the USA funded the truck driver's strike. Even Allende, I think, he wasn't aware the American government can overthrow him. Just five days after it was formed, President Salvador Allende's cabinet has suffered its first casualty. General Cesar Ruiz quit his transport minister. He also resigned as Air Force commander the Chilean economy collapses. The response is cataclysmic. While watching the Mineta being bombed was just unbelievable. There were two bomber pilots and they just, they'd fly around the building. They flew around our apartment building and bombed the Mineta and then they'd go around, they went around about 10 times. I thought will be some resistance, you know, because we don't believe all the army or all the armed force were with the coup. We were wrong. The military attack on the presidential palace is merciless. When the gunfire erupted in Chile 12 days ago, when the government of Salvador Allende overthrown, an estimated 350 Americans took shelter in Santiago and other cities. There was fighting going on between um, the snipers above us and the military men down below. So you were caught in the crossfire? Yeah. After three days, a man from the Peace Corps came and got us out, what? and escorted us out. You know, Salvador Allende, you know, he declared war on the middle class, and the middle class fought back. And they basically, they killed him. Within hours of the military coup, Allende is found dead in the Moneda Palace. He dies from a bullet wound to the head. It was probably suicide, but a debate has raged ever since. Many people say today, Allende committed suicide. But the information we receive today, Allende was killed for General Palacios. I personally have no sympathy for Marxism, but um, the government had been elected by the people, and uh, this is a military coup d'etat. The military leader is General Augusto Pinochet. Allende had appointed him commander-in-chief of the army only a month earlier. I will tell you very shortly what has happened in the last 10 days. The country atravesado por una onda crisis was going through a deep crisis. 
they broken my house, destroyed my books, and everything. And many people from this group were killed, like my dear friend, Dr. Hernán Enrique, who were disappeared, and they didn't refuse to give his call to his wife. Pinochet begins 17 years of a brutal military dictatorship. His government will kill over 3,000 people and torture more than 29,000. It was a terrorist state, you know. They used the power of the guns, you know, and the power of the army to create a, a silent society. Communism has been crushed in Chile, but the result is not freedom for the people. Treat yourself to the best gift in history this holiday season. Enjoy unlimited access to award-winning podcasts and thousands of hours of original history documentaries released weekly exclusively on History Hit. There are topics for all history lovers, from Pompeii to D-Day, Sign up via the link in the description for an exclusive discount. Don't miss out on this incredible opportunity to explore the past like never before with History Hit. The 1970s. The Cold War is accelerating out of control. East and West are pushing even harder for bigger and better nuclear weapons. The Soviet Union and the United States have accumulated thousands of nuclear weapons. Our two nations now have five times more missile warheads than we had just eight years ago. But we are not five times more secure. Supposedly very, very sophisticated command and control systems in place with both the United States and the Soviet Union really weren't very sophisticated at all. And it's sheer dumb luck that we avoided during the Cold War years and indeed subsequently a nuclear weapons catastrophe. By 1972, the USA has about 26,000 nuclear warheads. And the USSR has about 16,000. The United States and the Soviet Union are the only two countries that have the capability of a general nuclear war, and therefore the only countries that can end civilized life as we know it. Ever since they first appeared, nuclear weapons have invariably been regarded as the most dangerous weapons of mass destruction. This is still true, all the more so since the capacity of those weapons is not a constant value. It is growing. Then start building them in volume, you know, tens, hundreds, thousands of systems, any one of which is capable of destroying, you know, widespread uh, piece of humanity in the, in the blink of an, an eye. Both sides believe the only way to avoid annihilation is to be ahead of the other in destructive power. Missiles like the Pershing can deliver a nuclear warhead up to 1,600 kilometers. With its accuracy, it can penetrate small hardened targets or bury itself deep into the ground, creating an earthquake effect. This is the Boeing air-launched cruise missile being loaded into the bomb bay of a B-52. Formerly, this aircraft was the main strategic arm of the American nuclear deterrent. The most advanced element of the missile's construction, a map-reading computer, guides the weapon at ground-hugging height. At this level, the cruise would be difficult to detect in advance, as it would appear on a radar screen to be no larger than many birds. The Soviets will have an array of warheads with yields on the order of one megaton. Once you have that kind of an advantage, your competitor wants it. So there was really no way to avoid the you know, massive effort by both the Western interests and the non-Western interests to uh, possess the capability 
and once it's possessed, to improve it. This is why the Americans say their new weapons are needed. It's the Soviet backfire swing wing bomber. 70 of these supersonic aircraft and 130 of the Russians' own mobile nuclear missiles, the SS-20, are said to have been deployed in Western Russia this year. Our political systems couldn't keep up with the technological developments. These were capabilities that were just almost unimaginable, and therefore the political and, and diplomatic processes, you know, were constantly trying to catch up. The latest development is one missile with many nuclear warheads, each capable of striking a different target. The multiple independently targeted re-entry vehicle, or MIRV. The Soviets have successfully demonstrated in flight test the MIRV capability. There have been four ICBMs in development. Two of them have already been demonstrated with the MIRV capability. We expect that the MIRV capability is likely to be associated with the other two. Some of the Russian MIRVs have 38 warheads each. Just got out of control. It's that simple. But I would also not underrate the importance to humanity and to our own people of taking constant steps to, uh, to get the nuclear problem under some discipline. Both sides have already signed one treaty, SALT-1, to freeze ballistic missiles at 1972 levels. But it is not enough. The next treaty aims to put the nuclear war machine in reverse. The Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty 2, or SALT 2. There were moments and periods of real hope during the Cold War that sanity would prevail. The Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, SALT, in the 70s. The United States alone cannot lift from the world the terrifying specter of nuclear destruction. We can and will work with others to do so. There's always been a deep understanding of the horrors associated with nuclear weapons, a deep understanding of their total unacceptability. The trouble is that hasn't stopped gigantic stockpiles of nuclear weapons accumulating up to 86,000, I think, was the, the highest total during the Cold War years. SALT II talks are given a boost by the new U.S. president. Well, I've heard great things about you and your service here in Washington. Thank you very much. I hope to form a very close relationship with you personally. And Thank you very much. And also you. with Mr. President. Anatoly Dobrynin, the Soviet ambassador here since the Kennedy days, brought with him a gift of hand-carved Russian dolls. As he began an official relationship with his fifth American president. Uh, president Carter's approach to uh, dealing with the Russians was I'm going to get inside the heads of the Soviet leaders and I'm persuasive enough and convincing enough that they will see our model is better than theirs. He was very, very sensible in his understanding of the risks associated with war and nuclear war in particular and made a pretty significant contribution to moving the game forward. And we will move this year a step toward our ultimate goal, the elimination of all nuclear weapons from this earth. More sensible, more humane heads uh, that just did understand the catastrophic risks involved and was very reluctant to engage in the kind of adventurism which um, you know, was so troubling with some other presidencies. Leaders on both sides no longer believe that war will be prevented by the fear of mutually assured destruction. The fear grows that despite MAD, someone could still push the button that would start World War III. There's therefore always a possibility that misunderstandings may lead to confrontation. At the end. Salt II 
replaces mutually assured destruction with a new idea, detente. Thus, we must be clear at the outset on what the term detente entails. It is the search for a more constructive relationship with the Soviet Union. In Vietnam, after 12 years of superpower proxy war, there is a note of optimism. For the first time in 12 years, no American military forces are in Vietnam. All of our American POWs are on their way home. The 17 million people of South Vietnam have the right to choose their own government without outside interference. And because of our program of Vietnamization, they have the strength to defend that right. We have prevented the imposition of a communist government by force on South Vietnam. But President Nixon speaks too soon. When the supply, the military aids from the United States were cut off in late 1974, the result was inevitable. We couldn't fight with our bare fist. April 1975, the Viet Cong have crossed the border dividing North and South. The surge towards the capital of South Vietnam begins. Battles for control of the roads leading to Saigon are now well underway. The long-awaited phase two of the communist spring offensive has begun. Bodies of the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong enemy were left to rot in the streets. Nowadays, the bodies are just left there until they're mutilated by animals and the traffic. I lived my last days of the war in the front line because I was a medical doctor of a ranger regiment. They keep on draining on us with, with their most powerful um, artillery. And we all have to dig down in the ground um, and then live like rats and in the trenches there. If you press your ears to the ground, you can hear the faint rumbling of enemy tanks in the vicinity and that scared the hell out of everyone. We were in the hottest spot and I was captured alive by the enemy. If you are in a starving condition and doing hard labor from dawn to dusk, all you can think of is food. All you can think of is a few minutes rest. they kind of reduce you to animal level, and that's brainwashing. In only a few days, the communists reach the outskirts of Saigon. The jets attacked during the rush hour in Saigon when the streets are packed with traffic. Shops, banks and offices were closed and people began jamming the streets all over again in their hurry to get home. The international community responds immediately to the invasion. As foreigners, mostly French and Americans and Germans, rush to buy tickets for any flight out. Embassies evacuate their staff. Obviously, when you pull out of a place like this, there's criticism that you're going out too soon and maybe promoting evacuation panic. No, I don't think one could be said to be doing that. You've seen for yourself the flood of Americans going out. Saigon, April the 30th, 8 o'clock. The last American helicopter on the roof of the American embassy prepares to lift off the last of the evacuees fleeing before the advancing communist armies. Most foreigners manage to escape but the South Vietnamese are left to their fate. And for hours after the last departure, scores of people still crowded onto the embassy roof in the vain hope of rescue. I think these people up here are committing suicide staying up here, but what can you do? 
hundreds scrambled in panic onto any boats they could reach, not caring how they got aboard or what they left behind. After several failed attempts, finally me and my fiance, who is my wife now, we escaped together. We knew the, the danger, but we decided we better either leave in freedom together or die together. And it was a very, very treacherous sea journey in a very small boat, nine meter long, 33 people. And on the boat, you know, you can just touch the water here because it's so overloaded. The capital of South Vietnam awaits the arrival of the victors. And then, shortly after midday, came the climax of 30 years of fighting. They were a disciplined force. Among the thousands who arrived, there wasn't a single reported case of theft, drunkenness, rape, or shooting. People who hours earlier had feared for their lives now turned out on the streets to cheer and welcome. The sense of relief in Saigon was almost tangible. Not everyone saw defeat so optimistically. This officer shot himself in front of the soldiers' monument a couple of hours before the communists entered the city. And on the 30th of April, Saigon fell, and the, the then President Zeng Wenmin capitulated. And tears streamed down my face. I cried silently for my country. It was a very, very powerful feeling of anger, frustration, and hatred, hatred, hatred for, for the betrayal of allies. People will always agree with the word losing, but that's what it was, we lost. When South Vietnam fell, seven other countries fell in very rapid succession to communism. As the first day of peace for 30 years dawned in Vietnam, the banks and some shops remained closed. But in Saigon's markets, it was business as usual. There were, of course, some changes. In the main market, traders were quick to peddle a new line in flags. Hanoi was calling the tune now, and everyone had to march to it. I think South Vietnam is just a victim in a global chess game. As the parade of hardware went on, the overriding impression was one of finality, that the communists had established beyond all question a tight and unopposed control over the land and people that had suddenly become theirs. As one proxy war ends, another is firing up. This one will last 27 years. It will cause just as much death and destruction as Vietnam. 1975, Angola is on the rebound from colonial occupation. The Portuguese have just pulled out. They just left the freedom a movement had to fend for themselves. The, it was the survival of, this, of, the, of the strongest. The MPLA then was the one that uh, was strong in Luanda, the capital, and therefore was on hand on the 11th of November, 75, to declare independence. Power is taken by the popular movement for the liberation of Angola. 
the MPLA. The popular movement was born during the 14-year guerrilla campaign against the Portuguese. The MPLA is communist. It has both popular support and Soviet weaponry. The Russian BM-21 rocket launcher, devastating weapon in their armory. Each lorry can fire 40 high-explosive rockets, each with a range of 12 miles. To learn what it is like to be under fire, three quivering recruits faced a Kalashnikov rifle and a machine gun firing live ammunition. The Soviet Union itself, I mean, could not send its own soldiers there. Uh, they, they, I think there's a protocol that exists between uh, Moscow and Washington that, that they themselves physically should not be involved. They send their allies. The National Liberation Front of Angola, the FNLA, and the National Union for Total Independence of Angola, UNITA, also fight for control. Eight weeks ago, these young men were in the Angolan bush or living in the shanty towns of Angola's cities. Now, after an intensive course of Cuban and Russian instruction, they are set to join the popular movement's 30,000-man army. The Soviet Union has sent close to $200 million worth of uh, military equipment to Angola in the last nine months. Between five and 7,000 Cuban military forces are in Cuba, are in uh, Angola, and the, in fact, they seem to be everywhere except in Cuba. Uh. It was, again, uh, this external issue of what was called the Cold War. This one is uh, support the Marxist, Leninist, uh, and the other one is capitalist, Washington, you had to choose sides. You could not be in Angola now without being for and against. So that, that was quite traumatic. There were proxy wars going on all around the place. Angola uh, was another absolutely catastrophic one. In Africa, massive death tolls. We just forget the scale of this sort of stuff that was going on year after year, often accompanied by atrocity crimes and just the worst kind of behavior imaginable. Those people, they don't know what you're fighting about. They just want to go on with their ordinary life, to go and till the fields. Here yeah, there are goats and sheep and cattle. They don't know all these big principles about democracy and Marxism. And... The USA supports the opposing factions, the FNLA and UNITA. MPLA is getting more arms, is getting more tanks, is getting more Cuban mercenaries. So we are prepared to meet any offensive against us from the MPD. Angola is a very big country, being in somewhat in Central Africa, that if the Soviets were able to really create a, uh, a vassal state uh, in uh, Angola, uh, using their troops and Cuban troops, that that could be a base from which communism could spread throughout the African continent. We know that uh, the Soviets have picked one side and automatically we pick the other. Well, we uh, are on the verge of spending uh, our first $100 million and might be more than that. Uh, Angola had a lot of fertile uh, grounds and they had uh, a number of minerals. They did have oil. Well, Angola was a source of mineral resources and uh, deeply attractive as a war zone between the, the major powers uh, as a result, neither wanting the other side to get their hands on these kinds of resources. American support includes money and weapons. 
The USA also attempts to cover its tracks. They do not send soldiers. They send the means for the anti-government forces to acquire them. The CIA is providing money for the FNLA and UNITA to pay mercenaries. And this covert is not something that you can report to the U.S. Congress. It, it's a covert thing. You kill and uh, everyone will say, you terrible atrocities. Uh, people burnt uh, alive in their sleep. Oh, terrible people and so forth not knowing that they are funded by the CIA. To press the point home, some posters showed a mercenary helmet with American dollars pouring from it. Mercenaries, people who take part in armed conflict in foreign nations for private gain. These guns for hire bulk up the FNLA and UNITA forces. The term mercenary always has a bit of a bad name uh, as it relates to Angola. So it's people really, their, their starting point and their end point is money. With a huge supply of men and machinery on both sides, the Angolan people are swamped by a massive war. They were really dangerous times. There were always breaks on the likelihood of the Soviet Union and the United States actually going to the brink as, and, and over the brink as against each other. But none of those restraints seem to apply in terms of uh, the benighted masses in Africa and elsewhere who were, you know, pawns in this larger game. The effects are of the angle and war on the people were very, very uh, bad. It kept the na nation in a very impoverished state for a long time. A lot of landmines were put out, a lot of limbs were lost, a lot of people were killed, villages destroyed. This 10-year-old boy was seriously hurt in the attack on Kahama. His leg has been severed. The civilians have fled. Kahama has been abandoned to the cows and the soldiers. The people of, of Angola were, were really, really suffering, and uh, all the resources were going towards the war effort. Completely, what should be going to education, to health, to housing, to road infrastructure, and so forth. The prolonged conflict and the deaths and destruction and so forth, that, that hurt. As far as fighting is concerned, for us, the Cubans or the Russians have no right to kill Angolans. I don't prefer anyone. I prefer the Angolans to be uh, left alone so they solve their problems. The mercenaries have a reputation for brutality. They are also illegal under the Geneva Convention. There was uh, a number of mercenaries from different uh, countries that went up to fight on both sides, both with the communist forces and the Western-backed forces. And so there were a lot of uh, uh, executions and extrajudicial uh, killings that went on during that period. If captured, mercenaries are not classified as prisoners of war. They are tried as common criminals. Luanda, capital of newly independent Angola, the men in the dock are mercenaries. Their leader was Costas Georgiou, who went under the name of Colonel Callan. All my men, which have captured the so-called mercenaries, and all the rest of my soldiers, which you have captured, were all under my direct command. So any responsibility and any charges against them, OK, they were following my orders. They were just soldiers. 13 men are under trial for their lives. Three are Americans, and the other 10 are British. They were paid to fight against the MPLA, the movement which won the Civil War and which now runs Angola. Having been captured in action, they have now been charged with crimes against peace and against Angola. Barker, do you still maintain that you do not want a British lawyer? I trust the Angolan people. I hope to have a fair trial with the Angolan people. I want an Angolan lawyer. 
Many of the mercenaries have had no military training prior to joining Callan's army. Was it really worth all the trouble and all the, all the, all the killing? Yeah, I'd go back again, yeah. Why? Uh, to fight communism. I went out there basically to, <laughs> to get enough money to buy a house. There'd been a total of about 200 British mercenaries involved in the war. Some of the men on trial were caught by Callan himself and treated as deserters. Who are you under? Callan. I'm under Callan. He's a commander of the North. He was a nutter. Fourteen British mercenaries, it's alleged, met their death at Michaela. One of them was killed by Callan himself. The others were shot on his orders by a group led by Callan's second in command. He had shot the young soldier. Copeland mm -hmm. then took the rejects away, stripped of their uniforms. Mm -hmm. And put them into the back of a truck. And they were driven away. And the next, really, that anybody heard was a sort of long burst of firing. Most observers felt that though the death penalty had been asked for, it was unlikely to be carried out on anyone, apart perhaps from Callan. That's what I want to say, and I don't want to answer no more questions. Okay? Mm. No disrespect. The verdict is guilty. The crimes include murder. The sentences are severe. Nine of the men are given 16 to 30 years in jail. The other four get worse. Their leader, Costas Giorgio, AKA Tony Callan, is joined by Andrew McKenzie, age 25, Derek Barker, age 35, and Daniel Gearhart, age 34. They are sentenced to be shot. We have appealed to uh, over 10 countries. There's been a direct appeal to uh, President Neto. There has been an appeal through international organizations like the International Red Cross. The American and British governments talk directly to Angolan President Agostino Neto. President Neto himself uh, stated that he would wait before signing the order for execution until he had looked at the world reaction to the death sentence which has been handed down by the tribunal. Mrs. Gerhard, if you could talk to the, the Angolan president directly, what would you say to him? To add plate clemency for the commuting of his sentence. Ten days later, all four convicted mercenaries are lined up to face an MPLA firing squad. Andrew McKenzie is in a wheelchair as the result of combat injuries he chooses to stand for his execution. The Angolan War will escalate before it ends. A huge new wave of American and Russian support will fan the flames. The fighting and atrocities will continue until 2002. Amazingly, negotiating teams from the East and West managed to keep the SALT II talks going. Building a relationship between governments that have been opponents for 30 years is not easy. NATO estimates that the Warsaw Pact has almost three times as many battle tanks as the West. The Russian foreign minister argued that there was no imbalance and that NATO and the Warsaw Pact had parity in military strength. Arguments continue on both sides about the finer points of the treaty. It does not permit the Soviet Union to build one additional modern ballistic missile on submarines above the level of 950 that we agreed upon. Both sides have developed different nuclear strategies. The USA has focused on missile accuracy while the USSR has been developing even larger warheads. By now, the world has enough weapons to destroy itself several times over. 
and there's still no agreement on how to stop the buildup. We have uh, continued our discussions with the Soviet Union uh, on salt and other matters. In March, when I was there, the Soviet Union made a proposal which in concept was worth looking at, though its numbers were not, have not proved acceptable to us. Just as SALT II is making progress, a chilling headline stops everything. June 1977, a new nuclear weapon is being developed. Lack of communication in government meant that the US president is not told about it. Jimmy Carter finds out when a Washington Post headline flashes across the globe. The neutron bomb was a development of the thermonuclear weapons, a devilish weapon, basically, totally inhuman. The neutron bomb. Tests have been covertly carried out in Nevada back in 1963. Research continued quietly under Nixon and Ford. The neutron bomb, when we, when we heard the news of that, I mean, it's the, the ultimate sort of doomsday weapon in a sense, I suppose, killing people without knocking over buildings. President Carter defines himself as a peacemaker. But the tank force of the Soviet-controlled Eastern Bloc countries is about three times that in Western Europe. Despite the horrific implications, Carter sees the neutron weapon as the only way to stop a Soviet land invasion. The neutron weapon is designed to use to be used against a massive and perhaps overwhelming tank forces. You could actually stop an invasion with neutron bombs by killing all the tank crews, all the infantry and everything else, and keeping their tanks and, uh, and stopping, stopping the advance. The neutron bomb has a small blast range, but releases 10 times the amount of lethal radiation. This new weapon has not yet been deployed, but it is already causing unrest. The Russian foreign minister stated bluntly that NATO's expected decision to station the new nuclear weapons in Western Europe would destroy the basis for negotiations on further disarmament. Despite international objections, President Carter tries to sell this new weapon to countries in Europe. Now, we're not building these weapons for ourselves. We're building these weapons for our NATO allies to, to uh, protect their territory. Anti-bomb demonstrations flare up all over Europe. The answer is no decision has been made with respect to the neutron bomb. Then the game changes. The USSR detonates its own enhanced radiation weapon. President Carter has uh, made publicly known uh, his uh, postponement of taking a decision on production of those weapons in order to, in the meantime, ask the Soviet Union to respond in kind. Hastily convened negotiations secure a pledge from the Russians. The public pressure in Europe does not abate. Carter decides to shelve the neutron bomb. The decision has been taken right now. We uh, think it's a wise one, politically, diplomatically, and the framework of our common desire for arms limitation. Work on another terrible weapon of the Cold War is stopped, and not a single neutron bomb is sent to Europe. Strategic arms limitation talks have been going on for seven years. Lack of progress in nuclear disarmament fuels public anger across the West. Finally, in June 1979, there is a breakthrough. Today, we are on the threshold of signing a strategic arms agreement that achieves our purpose. 
Mr. Brezhnev came to Vienna in June to sign SALT II, perhaps the most significant arms limitation agreement since the Second World War. SALT II sets regulations on many types of missiles, and it commits the USA and the USSR to limit their nuclear weapon systems to 2,400 each. This is a milestone in the Cold War. For 30 years, the world has been accelerating towards a precipice. SALT II has started to apply the brakes. It will restrain the nuclear arms race. It will lessen the likelihood of nuclear war.